hello everyone so we are going to start the first chapter on kinematics uh, and uh, before we actually start the technical discussions uh, i believe that this chapter at least the name of this chapter will be familiar with uh, uh, familiar to both the mechanical guys uh, the mechanical students and the manufacturing mm -hmm. students uh, from their earlier courses on fluid mechanics and thermoplastic science and the underlying philosophy that we are going to follow while covering kinematics in our current course of mechanics of solids will be exactly the same as in fluid mechanics and thermoplastic science meaning that uh, we are going to uh, be solely concerned with the way that the motion is described or the deformation is described in this chapter and we are not at all going to be bothered with the way that that motion is brought about meaning that we are not going to be concerned with the forces the torques and the general and in general the loadings that are uh, that the bodies are being subjected to so without any further ado let us begin our, uh, our study of kinematics so the first section we are going to cover is uh, is called deformation and displacement so in this section uh, we'll focus our attention on developing a very general mathematical theory or framework by which we can describe the deformation and the displacement of a general three dimensional body so the first thing that we are going to consider is a general three dimensional body so like this the general three dimensional body and uh, this will call to be in the initial or the undeformed state so this is the undeformed state now under some loading which we do not care about within the ambit of this chapter this three dimensional body will undergo some deformation and it will end up in this final or current configuration so this is how it deforms please note that there is no restriction uh, as to whether the volume will be preserved or any such notion for now it is completely general the volume can change the shape can change it can go from one place to another so no restriction at all so this will be our current state Now, in order to describe, uh, to precisely mathematically describe the deformation, what we are going to consider is a generic point within this body. So, so this is a generic point within the body, and let it be denoted by the capital letter P. Correspondingly, uh, when this body is deforming from the undeformed to the current state, depicted by this arrow the material point p will end up let's say here and in this current state it will be depicted by the letter p with a dash so the the dash on the prime uh, this here it represents the position uh, of of the same material point which was this now in order to mathematically describe this we need uh, first of all to set up our coordinate axis so So instead of calling this as x, y, z, which we are usually uh, familiar with, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to call this as capital X1, capital X2, and capital X3 in order to keep the mathematical description as general as possible. Now you understand that this x1, x2, and x3 are like the scalar components of, uh, or it will help us to set up the scalar components of a position vector so the position vector of the point p 
with reference to this coordinate axis will be given by this capital X vector whose components uh, we understand will be x1, x2 and x3. Please note that this is in the undeformed state and in this undeformed state uh, the position vector is given by the capital X uh, letter. Correspondingly when this deforms and comes here for this p dash point which is basically the same point but in the uh, current state the position vector again with reference to this coordinate axis it will be given by the small x. So this is how we represent it. Now please note that this position vector x is very much dependent on the initial position vector in this configuration or in this undeformed state. So the values that this, uh, this small x1, x2 and x3 can take this will be very much dependent on the values of the capital x1, x2 and x3 and in general it will also be a function of the time at which we are taking this particular picture. So for our mathematical representation what we say is the x1 is a function of all the scalar components x1 capital x1 capital x2 and capital x3 as well as of the time t the scalar component x small x2 is again a function of all the scalar components capital x1 capital x2 and capital x3 in the undeformed state and similarly the third component x small x3 is again a function of all the scalar components capital x1 capital x2 and capital x3 as well as time in the undeformed state. So this three pieces of information it is together depicted in a compact form through this vector representation. All right. Now, in index notation, uh, this will be depicted by x i, x i, function of x j, comma t. Now, uh, in every class that I teach this, there's always a little bit of a confusion among the students that why perhaps we are not using the same index i here well uh, there are two reasons here uh, first of all is that suppose if we were to write i it gives us a sort of wrong impression it may give us a sort of wrong impression that perhaps the ith component of the position vector in the current state it perhaps depends only on the ith component of the initial position vector and that would be a wrong notion because actually it is dependent on all the three components capital X1, X2 and X3 as we have written out explicitly here. Furthermore, if you are a little bit familiar with uh, index notation but not too familiar then there might arise uh, some sort of a wrong impression that perhaps in some way some kind of uh, repeated index is happening here because this is small x i and then there is a capital X i and perhaps it denotes some kind of a summation and that would be again completely wrong. So in order to avoid all those confusions or possibilities of misrepresentations, uh, misinterpretations, uh, we keep these two indices separate. All right. So the next, uh, the plan for uh, our next discussion is to go on to the definition of the displacement. So that will do in the next part of our lecture. Thank you.